Good morning, students. Welcome to the second session of International Law and Diplomacy. Now, before I go further into our class sessions, I believe that uh, some of you have addressed certain concerns uh, regarding admission into the Google Classroom or the Zoom Classroom, rather, I would say, during the, uh, like, you know, when the lectures are going on. Um, I'd like to just give you a little bit of clarification. In fact, I'd like to reiterate something that I mentioned it in my first class, and I believe probably you have not really understood that. Um, the rule for this class is that you will have to attend the class on time. Now, this is for your benefit, of course. I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, as I said earlier, I would allow the students to enter the class, say, around even 15 minutes late, in the sense, like, we are beginning at around 5 o'clock. So until 5.15, you have got buffering time. Okay, so 5.15, the class will begin. And say, in my discretion, I might allow the student to enter the class, say, around even 5.20, it's fine. And now when the lectures are on and when I am teaching, I may or may not allow the student to enter the class. You might have a question in your mind, why this variation? And why are you saying that you may or may not allow? The simple answer to that is, it is a distraction when the student keeps entering and exiting, entering, exiting, or coming to the class late. So I'll have to just stop the flow of my, you know, discourse in my lecture, and I'll have to admit the student in. So I'll have to again click the button, okay, admit the student in. So I have to keep, you know, clicking on that, uh, you know, the entry button saying that, okay, permit the student and so on. So that poses a little bit of distraction, not just for me, but also for you. See, the other students are, you know, listening to the class, to the sessions and to the lecture that is going on. And then you enter, some other student enters the class and I'll have to just pause. And even if I'm doing it simultaneously, then I just lose the rhythm. And you understand my point. So that's the only reason. So try to bear with me and try to cooperate. In fact, try to come to the class on time and that is for your benefit. Like, other than that, of course, you know, attendance is marked and I'm normally into the practice of observing the students who enter the class on time and, you know, who come in late. Um, that's just part of the process. And of course, you are evaluated on that as well. Class interaction as well is evaluated. Apart from that, a gentle reminder about your assignment. There will be no extension of date on the assignment because you cannot come to me, you know, at the nick of the moment and say, well, I'm not able to complete the assignment. And for whatever reason it might be, in case there is, a, you know, a plausible reason or I would say a reasonable cause for you not submitting the assignment, the only reasonable cause that I would really, uh, like, you know, anticipate god forbid is you know if any student is sick and for that of course you have to give me a you know you know a valid reason you know somewhere i would ask you like certain questions which will really convince me whether a student was really sick or not so see all this goes for your benefit and this is for you that you will complete your course on time and successfully the more vigilant you are the more alert you are it's good for you and you will be you know, earning maximum marks. You see, you earn marks. So I hope I have, uh, you know, um, replied to all of your questions. Um, and I hope you are convinced with whatever um, is my, you know, my strategy. And I, I, I'm sure you're convinced with my class. And I mean, that's the way it is. And you are expected and Rather, I would say you're obligated to follow the rules of this class, and that goes for your benefit. Okay, so now let's begin with the class. Um, last class, we learned about international diplomacy. We touched upon certain aspects of international law. We gave the, uh, you know, we went into um, 
the definition of international law, we spoke about use cogens, we spoke about certain principles like pacta sunt servenda, that is with respect to treaties and so on. Then we went into the aspect of diplomacy, what means diplomacy, why diplomacy is required. And we learned about diplomacy is a strategy that really unites nations. It is a strategy rather which is adopted by the nations in the best interest of world comedy and you know eliciting the you know the interchange or the transfer of trade and commerce between nations and eliciting good relationship between the nations and so on. In today's class, we are going to study a very important aspect, in fact, very interesting. It's interesting as well as a significant part of diplomacy, the types of dipl diplomacy or the forms of diplomacy. I'm reiterating, today's class, we are going to learn about the types of diplomacy or the forms of diplomacy. Okay, so having thus said the perspective now, let's go to our slides. Now, of course, I will substantiate and explain um, certain concepts there as well. Even while we are going through our slides, I will even explain certain concepts as we move on. So the types of diplomacy, chapter two of, you know, international law and diplomacy for this subject. In chapter two, we are having types of diplomacy or different forms of diplomacy. Now, in the last chapter, we learned about the meaning of diplomacy as being the strategic approach governed by legal norms towards building foreign relations through communication, negotiation, and dialogue with other countries by a particular country. Now, parliamentary delegations are thrust with the responsibility of building foreign relations. Now, what does this mean? Uh, here, we have actually spoken about within the definition and within this introduction, we have spoken about that diplomacy is a strategic approach within the ambit of law or within the presence of law or within the purview of law. It is an approach, it is a strategic approach adopted by the nations, okay, internationally within the ambit or within the purview of law, for what purpose? Towards building foreign relationship. How? Through communication, dialogue, negotiation with other countries, whatever maybe it depends upon the type of diplomacy it is or the purpose of the diplomacy model. Are you understanding me? So depending on that, probably they would negotiate or there is any, of course, negotiation is communication as well. What involves communication as well. So communication, negotiation, and dialogue is when you know two parties talk. That is, of course, here we are talking about countries. So when parties have a dialogue, the countries have a dialogue with one another. You know, diplomacy can be bilateral, that is between two countries, or it could be multilateral, that is between different countries. So now who engages? Or who are the mouthpieces of the nations? Of course, diplomats. So they are authorized diplomats, they are authorized representatives of the countries or a particular country. And of course, every country has authorized diplomats. So they may be even parliamentary delegations, in fact. So they represent the country and they engage in you know building foreign relationship through communication, negotiation, and dialogue. So what is negotiation in case it is something related to trade diplomacy in case it's a trade diplomacy so 
probably you would require require negotiations so negotiation how because you will have your own law that is a particular nation has its own law so it has to think about its own law then it tries to match up with the law of another nation or another country it is trying to build relationship with and then it it, it, it also takes into consideration the regional laws that are applicable for a particular trade for example you know there are multiple laws there certain governing laws and then accordingly they would negotiate negotiate whatever it is to be negotiated and communicate whatever is to be communicated so primarily the the the, the prerogative of um, you know diplomacy or you know even this diplomacy models is to build the foreign relations to have uh, you know international or world comedy to live in you know peaceful unity and amity with all the nations or to live with they have to have cordial relations with you know all the nations are you understanding me sometimes it is a parliamentary uh, you know delegations that trust with the responsibility of building foreign relations and so on so i'm sure you understood what is diplomacy and the purpose of diplomacy and so on Again, another way of putting it is a purpose of diplomacy is to, you know, strengthen the nation. Why? Because you're building cordial relationship. You're, you're, you're moving towards certain, you know, target, um, you know, mandates. You might, you might be, the, the nation may be having a mandate and it, it may be having a particular objective. So it uses diplomacy, okay, to strengthen the nation. And it serves in, you know, fortifying the relationship uh, with other nations, but advancing its own interests. So, of course, that means you would say that the main endeavor is to maximize the nation's advantages without the risk and expense of probably using coercion or force. And, of course, without causing any, you know, ill feelings. Are you understanding me without causing any ill feelings in the mind or the hearts of the other nations? So diplomats use diplomacy. I, I, I'm sure you've heard of the word diplomacy. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, in, in, in international law perspective, just even in the normal English perspective, what is diplomacy? When you say someone, okay, while well, uh, you say, well, well that, that lady is quite diplomatic or the person is quite diplomatic. In the sense, he, the person normally is cordial and tries to strike a chord in, uh, you know, without causing resentment and tries to get the work done. So that's diplomacy. So likewise, even in international context, we have diplomats who represent the nation and they go forward and they advance, uh, you know, the, the nation's interests in such a way that they do not really use coercion or any kind of manipulative tactics. But of course, and of course, without causing resentment, they try not to cause a resentment and they just get their job done. They, it's all how they represent well professionally and, you know, advance the interests of the nation that they are representing. So that means the key functions or the features of diplomacy to be like, you know, representing the nation, negotiating and reporting and protecting the general interest of the entire nation itself. And it normally facilitates not just, you know, communicating what is required, communicating not just what they want to communicate, but also it facilitates information as well. And it also solicits information from the other nations. And, you know, there is a kind of knowledge exchange and knowledge sharing, you see. So, 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 so that's how it is. That is all about diplomacy and international diplomacy. So now having, you know, set the perspective, and I've just spoken a little bit detail into it. So now we will move on to learn the various forms or types of diplomacy in the subsequent slides that we are going on now. And it is categorized based on the mode in which it is conducted and what subject or matter it addresses. I'm repeating. It's very simple. First, you'll have to just simply understand that you have understood diplomacy now. So now you'll have to understand the types. It's not complicated. So how are you going to understand the types? Now the types, you're going to understand the types depending upon the purpose of diplomacy. For example, let me give you a very simple example. What is the purpose of this class? You are learning, I am teaching. So we are a group. So the group is formed for what? The purpose of learning. 
right? You are learning. I'm, you know, um, imparting that education or imparting the, the, the content of the subject. I'm delivering the subject to you. You are learning it. So what is the purpose? The purpose of it is learning because a dissemination of information from my end and, um, you know, imparting knowledge and you're receiving it. So it's like teaching and learning. Are you understanding me? So likewise, even in diplomacy, simple as that. For what purpose is that diplomacy model? If it is trade, then it is called trade diplomacy. If it is something to resolve some kind of conflict, you could call it as a conflict resolution diplomacy. It depends. Suppose if it is, say, something related to finance, probably, where maybe one country wants to borrow some amount from another country, so then probably you could call it as a finance diplomacy. Are you understanding me? So likewise, we have various models depending upon what subject it is all about, what is the purpose, what is the matter it actually addresses. Are you understanding me? And of course, apart from that, you have bilateral diplomacy depending on how many nations are involved in that, whether it's two nations or multilateral, there are you know, different other nations, there are more than two nations. So you call it multinational diplomacy. So let's go forward and see. It's easy, just you'll have to give me a patient hearing. Now, the first form is trade and economic diplomacy. Excuse me. So this type of diplomacy revolves around strengthening the economy of the country to the mechanism of fortifying international relations. So what is a the mechanism? They want to strengthen the international relations in terms of trade, export, import, investments, and even taxation. So there are taxation laws that are applicable across the boundary, um, across the boundary of any nation. So there might be probably there are certain taxes that need to be paid. For example, if uh, you know you understand about uh, you know export and import, so there are certain charges, there are freight charges and different sort of charges which are involved there, like you know cost and freight and so on, CIF and so on. There are different charges. So, so what is the percentage that they would charge normally? Again, yet another concept is about VAT, and I'm sure you know about value-added tax. Some countries you know, follow VAT, some countries do not follow VAT. And you understand, like UAE follows VAT. Qatar is still in the process of thinking about following VAT. So, I mean, it has tried to implement, but in some other way. And again, in some other country, if you know, it depends again. So value added tax. So India has already adopted that. So there are different types of taxations. We'll not go into that aspect, but I'm just generally touching upon it and trying to say that if it is trade and economic dip uh, diplomacy, it involves all these aspects of investments, trade, export, import, and taxation, of course. Next is building business relations tactfully, smartly, strategically. Building business relations strategically or tactfully with a tact with other countries is one of the major prerogatives or it's one of the major aim under this form of diplomacy. What's the purpose of this model of diplomacy is to you know, build relation with other countries. Are you understanding me? Next is, uh, you know, moving further, where the country forges the reaffirmation of its interests. It, it, it tries to explain it. It tries to forge itself further and reaffirms its interest in international trade. It says, yes, we want to participate in international trade. It forges, it reaffirms its interest, forges forward and reaffirms its interest in international trade relations and participation. And consequently, that means as a result of that, international trade competitiveness rises to a healthy pinnacle. It rises to the level, to a highest level in, in the sense it, there is healthy competition. So developing undeveloped or underdeveloped and economically poor countries are supported with foreign aid also. So this also comes within the ambit of trade and economic diplomacy, even if it's a question of foreign aid. So foreign aid is taken by whom? By poor countries, by underdeveloped countries or you know, countries which are still developing. Sometimes they take it from you know, advanced nations and economically poor nations or, you know, underdeveloped nations take it from the developing nations. So they are supported by, by foreign aid, uh, you know, and 
uh, foreign aid comes within the ambit of course within this form of diplomacy as well so that apart when a country is devastated example is yet another example of you know the the, the next angle of trade app economic diplomacy is that when a country is devastated and afflicted with an inevitable crisis or unforeseen calamities, conflicts, and natural disasters, then the other nations enter in to provide relief. Of course, you know that in case there is any disaster, say there are cyclones, typhoons, and there is mass destruction, there is, you know, tsunami. So the other nations come forward and support the other nations, you know, so countries support each other in case of any tsunami and any kind of a conflict and so on. So the other nations enter the scene and they provide relief to the nations, afflicted nations in congruence with this concept of world committee that is in compliance with the concept of world committee, world brotherhood unity in terms of provision of economic support or even provisions in time, at times in terms of necessities or even holding talks with nations in case of boring conflicts, in case of a dispute between nations. So all this comes within the ambit of trade and economic diplomacy, especially when it, in case of any a warlike situation, when it tries to hamper trade and economic relations with, suppose, say, neighboring countries. Like, for example, let me tell you, we'll not go into the detail of that, you know, about the Russia and Ukraine war, and you know how the you know, the energy prices, petrol prices, even certain provision prices have really, you know, increased across the globe because of Russia and Ukraine prices. Because I, I, I know in UAE, even petrol, you know, really, you know, escalated. The price of uh, petrol really escalated in such a way that it was getting difficult. Like even the common man, they were really complaining about the escalation um, in price of petrol in UAE, whereas there were some other countries when I when I traveled even to Greece during that period, um, of course, during this ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, Greece had a normal rate. I wonder how, but however, UAE, though, I mean, the country is, uh, you know, oil rich country, of course, somehow the, the petrol prices, you know, uh, really shot up. And there's a kind of global recession that is trying to hit. In fact, we are already into that period at the moment. So that's because of the war. So what will happen here is, again, diplomacy plays a very important role. Diplomacy plays a very important role in trying to negotiate, you know, and trying to resolve certain conflicting situations and saying that it is really, um, you know, the world is really hit bad. So, you know, in terms of recession or even people are losing jobs and so on, you see, of course, when there is recession and there is no proper profits, so there is kind of cost cutting within the companies and uh, people are removed out of their jobs. You know, they are sad. Are you understanding me? So then what the nations would do, naturally, they will come forward and it is the diplomatic talks that would sometimes would support this kind of a situation and how well they strategize and uh, get the other countries or even the warring factions to, you know, understand and withdraw from whatever conflict that is in, they are in and try to compromise and bring a truce. Well, so now we'll move on to the next part that is cultural diplomacy. Uh, by the word, you would understand cultural, that is something related to culture of any nation. So this form of diplomacy actually emanated at the times where European countries owned vast colonies globally. And when the English colonized most parts of the world, of course, you're aware of that, that, you know, the British, the colonized most parts of the world, the British colonized Australia, India, Africa, you know, and um, in most parts of the world, they were, you know that they, they were there. So it was in this era that distinct cultures across the globe were sensed and recognized. So they, they really observed that there are different cultures. For example, for example, you know, there is uh, this ab originals in Australia. So there was one person who went along with he was a commander and he went along with his uh, you know ship and crew 
to a particular island and that island was actually Australia. And then he found that there are ab originals who are ab originals like the other absolute locals of that place who had a distinct language than that of England and so on. So, you know, they were considered as aboriginals and then they thought of colonizing that area and then Australia developed into a nation slowly step by step and today what it is. Of course, you know, if you talk about Australia, God rest our soul, you know, Her Majesty the Queen, like of course, she's a constitutional head of uh, Australia and now it is um, His Majesty King Charles who is now the constitutional head of Australia however you know the the parliamentary system is slightly distinct from England and uh, you know will not go into the the legal part of that of course so I'm just trying to give you an example of cultures and how Australia I was trying to give an example of how you know the, the aboriginals in Australia and how it was actually uh, discovered and how it was also colonized and how you know things happened there and of course India India has again its, its history it was colonized as well Africa again everybody knows it was colonized as well UAE was also a part of that once upon a time and, and so on likewise many other countries so further on i mean most part of the globe was part of the world was colonized by the english so there was this kind of cultural exchange different types of people apart from the english so they got to know the culture of every of every uh, you know nation or those days those those you know territorial demarcations which were there so of course the names were given and you know cultures are different we all know that so there is cultural exchange how how cultural diplomacy helps now they organize programs fairs exhibitions literature literature programs uh, cultural exchange programs so in, likewise they try to build connections so further on uh, like going by a slide now at the moment further on in 19th century culture was recognized as a dynamic instrument to build connections and progress as a society together as a whole the languages of various nations are recognized and today we have several languages recognized internationally so cultural programs were being encouraged and organized so under this model thereby the state governments that is in the sense we are talking about the countries here an international state refers to normally countries or a group that represents a country or a nation so they strategize the efforts towards recognizing and formulating culture based policies and programs cultural exchange in terms of art craft literature culture and civilization is organized next is digital diplomacy what is digital again you by the name itself you understand it is something related to the world today today we are known to be in digital age which is fortified by or strengthened by power solutions we are in the age of power solutions just at the click of a button there is a solution so we are in the digital age digital diplomacy you also are aware of ais that is artificial mm -hmm. intelligence you see artificial intelligence is permeating normally every field there are there are companies which have already adopted artificial in intelligence and where they have tried to you know include robotic mechanism in, in in place of human beings performing a job artificial intelligence in terms of software artificial intelligence in terms of learning teaching and so on so digital world digital diplomacy again for that purpose there are digital diplomacy channels that have contributed to us advancing international relationship why digital platforms such as media the internet social working tools etc in terms of exchange of dialogue e-commerce and so on as well as to promote di digitalization you've heard of cryptocurrency of course it is not really legal still in the entire world but they are moving towards a particular type of currency i do not know whether the world will really approve it but there are those who may not approve it like me but however it's my opinion but you know cryptocurrency is now trying to pick up that speed for example in uae cryptocurrency you cannot call it entirely legal but there are they are regulated there is a regulatory body where you take a license and you can promote cryptocurrency and people can invest in and can deal in terms of cryptocurrency. Well, so now digital diplomacy is in terms of 
you know, promoting search and digitalization as well as using today's, you know, digitalization and today's digital platforms such as media, internet, social marketing or social networking tools and so on in terms of exchange of dialogue, e-commerce e and so on. So the astute collaboration of digital diplomacy in international relations and globalization is of course commendable, it's applaudable. However, the not so palatable effects that is the demers is not so good effects of digitalization can be seen in the form of misuse of communication and it poses as an imminent threat to peaceful coexistence of the nation sometimes you know you send a, a message and sometimes it can be misused or it can be uh, you know misinterpreted as well so that's again a kind of uh, tea merit in terms of digitalization i'm sure you would agree with me on that and it poses an imminent threat of course to the peaceful coexistence of the nations on the other hand advanced defense tools and weapons though may be applaudable inventions Sure, you're aware of biological weapons and so on. So there are advanced defense tools and weapons that are invented, digital weapons, of course, like a person sits in one place and then he uses, um, you know, what is this? Um, we call it um, artificial intelligence. You use artificial intelligence and then you strike a person in some other country. You use drones and such mechanism. Um, I'll not go again into the details of it. Of course, there is news channels, and of course, you can go and uh, check news channels how artificial intelligence or even drones mechanism is misused at times, and uh, it is it, it is an applaudable invention. However, it can be misused, and it, thereby it has its own demerits when it harms or it causes harm to humanity when it is implemented. Uh, you know, there are instances in the world, without me taking the name of the nation, there are instances in the world where someone has really used, uh, um, you know, artificial intelligence and drones, specifically a drone that, you know, somehow managed to escape the airspace of another country and it tried to attack the other country. Go to... Just Google it out and you will know. You can find ample of examples on that, especially the most recent one, which I will not want to discuss now at this moment. Next type of diplomacy is mediator diplomacy. Now the mediator of, or intermediary diplomacy, you see the word mediator, someone who mediates, who comes in between, intermediary. By this term, you would understand someone who mediates, someone who intervenes, intermediary diplomacy comes in between in case there's a conflict you come in between or say okay stop fighting are you understanding me so he intermediates and say okay truce or he tries to say, propose ideas how to resolve conflicts between two boring factions so intermediary diplomacy is much reflected when a country or countries negotiate on behalf of some other country that may be in a conflict with a third state or country. For instance, in the ongoing 2022 Russia-Ukraine conflict, the world has got together to form allies, I'm sure you know this, in support of two countries. The ongoing 2022 Russia-Ukraine conflict, you see, the world has got together and they have formed allies in support of two countries. However, predominantly Ukraine in the light of Russia's diktat of forceful occupation and having trespassed several international war mandates. You know that and protocols, especially Russia's attack on Ukraine territories within civilian occupation zones has been extensively criticized by world politicals, including common man. The European countries of NATO, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States are supporting Ukraine. I remember in my recent trip to Italy, I when I, um, you know, disembarked the plane and I lighted and I entered, you know, Sicily's airport. It's called uh, Catalina, I guess today, but 
it is Sicily. The old name of that particular city is Sicily. And this Sicily is in my mind. So when I, you know, enter the airport in Italy, this is just in July, first week of July, 2022. I saw huge boats there saying that Ukraine citizens and residents are always welcome and they have this arms open wide and say you are welcome welcome to ukrainians so you know ukrainians because of this war have fled across europe and there are certain countries which are supporting it so of course poland is also there poland has accepted ukrainians but i remember italy where because i've been there and they have put boats all over ukrainian citizens are always welcome in the sense you can come here and take refuge at the time this war is going on there you can come and you know probably they would just excuse them uh, with respect to certain documentation as well probably so so they were encouraging ukrainians to you know come to Italy and stay for some time till the war gets over. So there are countries, uh, you know, who are part of NATO, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, United Kingdom and United States are, you know, big time supporting Ukraine. In fact, the United States and the United Kingdom are the biggest supporters of Ukraine. Now, apart from them moving to the uh, you know, the the east, you see the other side, you know, Japan, South Korea, Australia, of course, towards the end, and Canada, or also Canada, of course, I've already mentioned that, are also supporting Ukraine's announced sanctions. They imposed sanctions on Russia after it began the invasion of Ukraine. So Russia has a stronger support from China and North Korea, but Ukraine has got support of all the other nations that I mentioned about. Now, Russia is now caught up with China and North Korea. These are the two strongest supporters of Russia. Cuba is a close ally of Russia and countries such as Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Belarus, once a part of Soviet Union, they were part of Soviet Union, USSR. They were part of Soviet Union, and I'm sure you know history, but it was when Gorbachev, the then president, who recently, you know, expired, of course, so, so he was the one who was a key person who, you know, uh, uh, you know, tried to, uh, you know, from USSR, the country became just now they got a little bit disintegrated and today they are called Russia. So there are certain people who are blaming politically garbage. There are some people who are saying, you know, it has been a good move. They're supporting garbage. You understand? So Soviet Union, these countries like Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Belarus were once part of the Soviet Union. And now, whether they like it or not, they are supporting Russia because they have a collective security treaty organization that is CSTO agreement, designed between the six countries together. So therefore they are supporting Russia. And apart from that in the Middle East, Iran is the only country that is backing Russia as Russia supplied arms to Iran during the, uh, the war, the Iranian war that took place recently. So one of the largest democracies of the world, of course, is India. One of the largest de democracies, of course, is India, which has always maintained a neutral stand. So on whose side is India, Russia or Ukraine? So India says, well, I will maintain a neutral stand on the war with its strong conviction that it is proposed to Russia, expressing that this is not an era of war. So India says, this is not an era of war, so you can sort out problems to stop the war. So the world considers India as posing lopsided neutrality. Some people are not supporting India's stance, saying that you why are you you know not taking sides? Why are you just being neutral? So the world says that India is posing a lopsided neutrality. It's really not going to do any good. But India actually has been strong friends with Russia. Russia and India are good friends. And India has a heart for Ukraine as well. And anyway, Ukraine was a part of USSR once upon a time. You see, so they are saying that, well, we are friends, so I cannot really you know, side anyone, but however, I know what is going on is wrong. So this is what Indian politicals say. It is their mind. 
So India, therefore, today is a mediator. We're talking about mediation diplomacy or intermediary diplomacy. So India today is a mediator between the two nations owing to its good relations with the two world giants, the United States, I'm talking about the United States of America, we're now it, two world giants, United States of America, as well as Russia. Now this is the next angle we are looking at. Now India is also friends with United States and Russia. You see, and United States, of course, is supporting Ukraine. Ukraine was once a part of USSR. India has always been friends with USSR. It has always been friends with Russia. In fact, very good friends with Russia. It is very good friends with USA. It's very good friends with the UAE. It's very good friends with most of the countries in the world. So India has been trying to make use of this amity, the friendship that it has with the world, to get the two conflicting nations, Russia and Ukraine, to end the war. It's difficult. It's still trying, but the world says you have to make use of this amity, this kind of friendship that you have to get these two nations together and ask Russia to stop it. So India is known for being a mediator in such crisis, not just now, it's from, from the beginning. For example, during the 1950-1953 Korean War, India played a focal role, a significant role as a mediator, and it proposed a resolution to peace, that is truce, eventually resulting in the signing of the Armistice Agreement. Though this agreement, the Armistice Agreement, did not aid in culminating the conflict, however, it did help in establishing the NNRC, that is the Neutral Nations Repatriation Commission, chaired by India, with the help of which 20,000 prisoners of our POWs from both sides were released. So therefore, India has emerged as a diplomatic negotiator between conflicting nations since it has peaceful relations with most countries in the world. Of course, the only agony that India suffers today, till today, is a border dispute that it has with Pakistan and China. So these are the only two countries which, with which India is, you know, at loggerheads. It is not really having, you know, very peaceful relations. It's having border disputes still. Now there is peace. However, India has still not come to terms with Pakistan and China because of the border. And they are you know, claiming whatever India is claiming and the other countries are claiming a particular territory border and so on. That's a political part of it. Well, so, so this is about mediator diplomacy, how countries, diplomats can you know, this model is mediator diplomacy, how countries diplomats can go forward and try to bring, uh, you know, uh, you know, peace with between warring factions. And every country, for example, USA has been, you know, screaming its guts out from the beginning and asking Russia to please stop the war. But Russia did not, you know, pay a heed to it and did not yield to the request of USA, in fact, Russia today says that it is being threatened by the West. As for the recent uh, news that the president of Russia has really expressed. But the Russia uh, citizens or the Russians are in support of President Putin because they have no option. And they say that we are with the president. Obviously, they have to be, you know, faithful and they have to stand by their country and nation whatever it is you know what is right and what is wrong it's for the two countries to decide russia and ukraine and we just only pray and hope that you know it really ends the war ends and they come to an understanding somehow next is dollar diplomacy what is dollar diplomacy Dollar diplomacy was actually propounded in the year 1900s by the then US President Howard Taft, who served between 1909 to 1913, where he referred to it as a program that exchanges dollars for bullets. So the, this form of diplomacy is an approach that refers to the maneuvering of foreign affairs for tactful or strategical monetary gain, which was initiated by Taft, 
the then president between 1909 to 1913 in Latin America and East Asia to further U.S. interests. Now, this President Taft, he assured loans. This was a strategy that he adopted, and that's how dollar diplomacy model was set up. President Taft assured loans to these countries, to whom? To Latin America, East Asia, and for the, uh, yeah, to Latin America and East Asian countries. And he said that, okay, I'll give you loans in exchange for negligible percentage, a small percentage of military force and other commercial interests. However, this did not really work out to the extent that he actually expected. And this profoundly worked as it was more like an enslavement of trifling states to the large finance whales. You know, they, the, you know, you know, these small countries which were there, they were kind of really swallowed by large finance whales such as banks and financial institutions and industrial organizations. So therefore, dollar diplomacy did not actually really, you know, hit the mark to the extent that it was actually expected. However, this is one model of diplomacy and probably someone would build upon it and have, you know, a better model probably However, you might call it as dollar diplomacy, where you give funds and for interest and you know, support the nations in exchange for something. Well, next is gunboat diplomacy. What is gunboat? You have the word boat there. Gunboat refers to a small ship. The name itself suggests a small ship, like a skiff that carries army artilleries, weapons. It's a small boat which carries weapons and it discreetly carries it. No one would know really there are army weapons in that boat. It's called a gunboat. As the name suggests, again, this type of diplomacy reflects its position in having to use force to claim what it needs in terms of foreign policies and achieve its ends. Political Dictionary defines gunboat diplomacy as a practice of backing up diplomatic efforts with a visible show of military might. So the most famous type of gunboat diplomacy is known as the big stick diplomacy, which is actually devised by the US Vice President Theodore Roosevelt in 1901, who advised that one should speak softly and carry a big stick when implementing strategic foreign relation. He just meant to say that you need to be vigilant, though you, you have a calm demeanor, you need to speak softly, but you need to carry a big stick as a form of um, kind of self-defense whenever you're handling foreign relations. So in modern times, it was US President Obama who used this form big stick diplomacy in 2010 when he ordered an aircraft carrier to the Yellow Sea near North Korean shore during the North Korean War. Now, whether or not it was really, um, you know, what they say, it was, it really met the purpose is again another issue in fact it triggered some other action which we will not go into it so this was just an example for you that president obama used this form of big stick diplomacy in 29 2010 uh, when there was this north korean conflict next is public diplomacy Public diplomacy is more than political propaganda, of course, and it differs from the normal traditional diplomacy, which is advanced through professional dialogue. However, public diplomacy is a form that can influence the society of another country through strategic foreign policies, organizing international cultural events, exhibitions, um, cultural events, academic events, or even political events. Such diplomacy is devoid of corruption or bribery or coercion, which is which valid endeavors to keep such negativities at bay and concentrates on building relations through the public diplomacy tool to achieve its goals. Next is people's diplomacy. As the name suggests, the aim is towards building relations, exchanging information, building communication, obliterating communication gaps, obliterating means removing, absolutely, commercial communication gaps and developing partnerships in areas such as culture, tradition, economic development, sharing historical knowledge and so on. So this is people's diplomacy. As a conclusion thereby, there may be several forms of diplomacy consorts established based on the purpose and the nations involved to form a bilateral and or multilateral diplomacy. Some other types may include, again, based on vast areas and subjects such as exclusively development diplomacy, education diplomacy, health diplomacy, science and technology diplomacy, climate diplomacy, sports di diplomacy, uh, 
then artificial intelligence diplomacy and so on. So therefore, there are different types of diplomacy depending upon the subject matter. And the purpose ultimately of diplomacy is to maintain good relations or to develop good relations with other foreign nations diplomatically, strategically, in a manner that really would contribute to the concept of world committee. Well, so this is all for your second chapter. Now the PPT presentation as well as the video and your notes will be uploaded in the Google Classroom. We will meet for an online session next Friday at 5 p.m. You need to be there on time. That is on 30th of September. Assignments have to be submitted on time. I'm reiterating this what I mentioned earlier. And I'd like to add and say late submissions would attract a deduction of minus one per day of default. I'd encourage you to submit it on time. Earn good marks and learn the subject. Bye-bye. See you next Friday in an online session. Bye-bye.